Is the current COVID-19 wave over? Not quite, says Minister Ong Ye Kang, but it's likely to subside further. Taking over ownership and management of Sports Hub, what will it look like in the future? The Sports Hub will be made more accessible to Singaporeans. We want to make it a community icon that Singaporeans can identify with, feel a part of in their social and sporting activities. And out today, a report by DBS on how to stay ahead of inflation when real wages are falling. Hello, you're watching The Big Story with me, Chiao Su An. Subscribe to The Straits Times channel to stay up to date with our live news updates. The current COVID-19 wave is likely to subside further this week. That's according to Health Minister Ong Ye Kang in Parliament today, referencing falling case numbers as well as the week-on-week -week infection ratio dipping below 0.9 over the past week. And noting that Singapore hasn't tightened social restrictions this time, Mr Ong says the country is coping better with each wave. With each wave, we are coping better. We are riding through this current BA.5 infection wave without imposing further social restrictions or imposing border measures. In our hospitals, we impose fewer restrictions and hospitals are generally able to cope better than the last wave. That means that the Singapore society, we have taken another major step forward in living with COVID-19 as an endemic disease. And I think this is a big National Day present for all Singaporeans. Thank you. Minister Ong also says 60% of Singapore residents have likely been infected with COVID-19. But this doesn't mean the population has herd immunity. By and large, scientists around the world do not think herd immunity is achievable. Because the virus will continue to mutate, escape the protection of vaccines and then infect people. What is achievable is population protection against severe illnesses through vaccinations. And this is what enables healthcare system to weather through an infection wave, even with high case numbers, because the translation of case numbers into severe illnesses is very low. During the last Omicron wave at the beginning of this year, 2.4% of infected persons needed hospitalization. During this wave, 1.9% ended up in hospitals. The actual percentages are likely to be lower because not all cases are reported. In fact, Mr Ong says yearly vaccinations will be the norm in the near future to protect us from the risk of being reinfected with a COVID-19 variant. As of now though, there is no change to the Health Ministry's guidelines and recommendations. I have deliberately used the term up-to-date vaccinations rather than a second, third or fourth booster shots. This is because at some point, just like flu vaccinations, we have to stop counting the number of jabs we have taken and number of boosters we have taken. Instead, we must ensure that we get a jab at a suitable interval, maybe nine months, maybe a year. And this is something MOH will try to determine in the coming months. Meanwhile, Senior Minister of State for Health, Janil Puticherry, says MOH is preparing to roll out booster shots for children 5 to 11 years old in about two months' time. And their attention is also on children under 5, who are more vulnerable to infection and severe illness compared with older kids. Children under the age of 5 are currently the last group not yet protected by vaccination. MOH is preparing to start vaccination for those under five towards the fourth quarter of this year. The Health Sciences Authority, HSA, is currently reviewing the data submitted by Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna on their COVID-19 vaccines for this age group. We will provide an update when an assessment of the quality, effectiveness and safety of the vaccines has been completed. Currently, children under the age of five remain more vulnerable to COVID-19 infection 
and have higher rates of severe outcomes as compared to older children. This is similar to other respiratory diseases. However, the overall incidence of severe outcomes from COVID-19 infection remains much lower amongst children compared to adults and the elderly. Children needing medical attention should be seen by a GP or a polyclinic if unwell. Dr. Janelle also addressing the monkeypox situation in Singapore, that there's no evidence of a community spread. Zero links have been detected among the 11 cases in Singapore, and out of the 45 close contacts identified, none of the local contacts has tested positive. All close contacts who remained in Singapore are well, and 11 of them have completed their quarantine. Thus far, none of the local contacts had developed symptoms compatible with mon monkeypox, nor tested positive for monkeypox. There is therefore no evidence of further spread in the community from the reported cases. Close contacts were offered the smallpox vaccine as post-exposure prophylaxis, which is reported to be 85% effective at preventing monkeypox infection. To date, 11 close contacts have taken up the smallpox vaccine. However, and as recommended by the WHO, mass population-wide vaccination with the smallpox vaccine is currently not recommended as a preventive strategy for monkeypox, as the benefits do not outweigh the risk. The sports hub is meant to be the centre of sports in Singapore, but what will that look like after National Sports Agency SportsSG takes over the facility's ownership and management on December 9th? In a ministerial statement in response to 25 parliamentary questions, Culture, Community and Youth Minister Edwin Tong says an overarching consideration is to make the sports hub more accessible to more Singaporeans, envisioning it as a community icon. For instance, as part of our Unleash to Roar national project, children who have joined our new Active SG football academies can also participate in the year-end football tournament at the National Stadium. We are also working with MOE to host even more national school games, such as the track and field, netball, rugby competitions, as well as the Singapore Youth Festival performances, or even some sports days for schools at the Sports Hub. The plans for a National Day Parade for the next few years are not out yet, but regardless, the Sports Hub will be a place where all of us, both young and old, will be able to build treasured memories and meaningful shared experiences. Seniors from all walks of life can also participate in mass events such as Get Active Singapore, at community spaces in and around the Sports Hub, including the 100 plus promenade, OCBC Square, and the nice space along the waterfront. We also hope to see the return of the casual stroller or jogger to the stadium by enhancing access to the stadium. According to Mr Tong, the Sports Hub under the public-private partnership fell short of promoting community sports and lifestyle activities among several reasons he cited for the termination of the partnership. And while these community events are unlikely to yield any commercial return, compared with the international spectacles held at the Sports Hub, he says there's an intrinsic social value in realising a young athlete's aspiration to play in the national stadium or having seniors take part in activities at the iconic stadium grounds. And with more is sports correspondent Sazali Abdul Aziz. Thanks for joining us, Sazali. So with such a big push to bring more community activities to the sports hub, what do you think it spells for local sports, both at the grassroots and professional levels? I think certainly there's a lot of excitement on both sides. Uh, it's been less than two months since the announcement, but we've already seen a youth competition uh, the FC Bayern Youth Cup held uh, at the National Stadium two weeks ago. Uh, about 1,500 spectators uh, comprising families and friends attended the two-day event, uh, which took place right after uh, Liverpool played Crystal Palace, by the way. So that's the kind of uh, grassroots event that the government aims to inspire the community with uh, through sport. You can imagine uh, what it must be like uh, for a 13-year-old budding footballer to play on the same field uh, Mo Salah did the night before, for example. So um, there was no specific announcement related to professional sport, but uh, Mr. Edwin Tong did uh, mention how various elite sports uh, can benefit from the flexibility uh, offered by the government running uh, the sports hub. Uh, something that comes to mind uh, maybe could be the Lion City Sailors having their home games uh, in the Asian Champions League at the National Stadium instead of Bishan Stadium or Jalan Besar Stadium, uh, which are eight to ten times smaller. Uh, so yeah, we, we could see a lot of changes. 
Sounds very exciting. So do you see this emphasis on community then changing the Sports Hub's approach in hosting international marquee events? Well, I, I don't think those goals are mutually exclusive. The government has made no bones about the fact uh, it wants to see a more vibrant calendar and more international sporting events. Uh, and Mr. Tong mentioned how uh, the SHPL fell short of securing high-profile multi-year sporting events. So I think that's one of the areas that they will look to address. Uh, as we said, you know, we've spoken about the, the push to have more uh, community usage of the facility, uh, which is not just uh, the stadiums, mind you. Uh, so I think in 2023 and beyond, uh, we'll see a, a concerted, even push uh, on both fronts. So Sports SG will incorporate a holding company to own and operate the upcoming Kalang Alive precinct and a subsidiary will be set up specifically to own and manage the sports hub. So earlier Mr Tong says that all SHPL employees have been offered to cross over into the new corporate entity. But by having the same people on board, how different can the running of the sports hub be from what it was for the past few years? Well, I think we have to be clear, it will not be an identical team. In fact, it may be a completely uh, different one. Uh, the team that will uh, manage the Sports Hub will largely come from Sports Singapore, uh, and they have been preparing for the possibility of stepping in for, for quite a while now, as Mr Tong said in Parliament. Uh, what the government has committed to is that current SHPL employers will be uh, offered the chance to, to port over, although the government has not provided any further details on whether they will take up uh, this option at all. They, they might not. Uh, so with a new direction and, and with uh, largely new staff at the helm, I think we will see uh, a pretty pronounced difference uh, in the way Sports Hub uh, is run in the future. I'm very excited to see what the Sports Hub will offer us in the future. That was Sazali Abdul Aziz, sports correspondent at The Straits Times. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is in Singapore on a two-day visit and she called on President Halima Yaakob at the Istana earlier today. According to Singapore's Foreign Affairs Ministry, they affirmed the excellent and long-standing partnership between Singapore and the U.S. The U.S. Congregational Delegation also met with Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, during which PM Lee highlighted the importance of stable U.S.-China relations for regional peace and security. And in other news, lawyer and former Reform Party chairman Charles Yeo failed to turn up in a district court this morning to represent his client in a trial. His current whereabouts are unknown, but in an Instagram post on Saturday, he said he intends to seek political asylum in the UK. Yeo was earlier charged with unrelated offences, but was given permission last month to leave Singapore for Vietnam to meet a witness linked to today's trial. But he hasn't returned. Singapore is launching its first ever green bond to finance major public sector green infrastructure projects. The Monetary Authority of Singapore says it's looking to raise at least 1.5 billion Sing dollars from the sale. The green bond will be launched via a book building process within the week, with a tenor of either 30 or 50 years. The bonds are open to individual investors, so do look out for more details in the coming days. It's not always bad news when inflation and interest rates go up. If you're a saver, you could be earning higher interest from your bank. And that's exactly what Singapore's largest bank, DBS, has done. From today, customers with a DBS multiplier account will enjoy higher rates of up to 3.5% per annum, a rise from 3% for balances over $50,000. It's the first known local bank to increase customers' returns on their regular savings. This comes as a new DBS study finds that income is not keeping up with inflation for some 40% of its 1.2 million retail customers. It means that over the last year, almost half a million people saw their income grow by less than 5%, which is lower than Singapore's average consumer price index inflation of 5.2% in the first half of 2022, and lower than DBS's own CPI forecast of 5.1% for this year. Joining us now is Irvin Sia, who co-authored the report, 
He is a senior economist at DBS. Thanks so much for taking the time, Irvin. So tell me, if income is not keeping up with inflation and customers are now spending 64% of their income versus 59% just a year ago, what can they do to better manage their finances? Well, um, inflation is affecting everyone. Uh, I think this is, in fact, the time where people really need to exercise sustainable financial planning. Now, um, and what can they do? I think there are several things that they can do. Uh, for example, they need to review their budget regularly because one of the key findings from our report is that um, some of the key um, you know, items that people are spending on, and in fact, the expenditure on those items has went up a lot, are actually discretionary by nature. So I'm referring to shopping, entertainment, and travel. These are all discretionary items in nature. So we need to basically moderate and keep such discretionary spending in check. So henceforth, we need to review our budget regularly. Um, and also, um, I think what people can also do is that um, they may want to um, you know, set aside some emergency cash reserve uh, in, I mean, basically, uh, you know, in times of raining days. I mean, we went through COVID. COVID was a regressive uh, event, it affected many people. So for those who will actually have ample, um, you know, reserve in the savings, basically put them in a better position to weather through the difficult times. And finally, I think an important thing that people can do to help them win the race against inflation is to invest wisely. I think if they're able to invest and generate some form of returns that will help them beat the effects of inflation, then obviously they will not only be able to preserve their original principle, their savings, they will also be able to generate some returns that can help them, you know, in the long term, for example, for those who are actually, you know, preparing for their retirement. So let's turn our focus a bit more onto specific groups. Your study found that those with the lowest income and boomers are more vulnerable to high inflation. Why is that? Yes, indeed. Um, you know, we often like to say that, you know, life can be like a rat race. Um, and in fact, inflation has intensified that pressure. The question is, you know, are we winning or losing against the race uh, with inflation? Now, some of us probably, you know, are, you know, coping it better, but there is a segment of the society that are really struggling and being hit hard by high inflation. And that's the low income group and also the baby boomers. So what we have seen is that their income growth is way lower than inflation rates. Say, for example, those earning below 2005, their income growth was as low as 2.5%. This is just half of a threshold of 5% inflation rate that we have set. Do know that in the first half of this year, inflation rate has averaged 5.2%. So when your income growth is lagging behind inflation, so what's happening is that you're actually seeing you know, a decline in your real income cost of living has actually went up faster than the increase in your income. So therefore you will feel stretched. So the low income group and the baby boomers are the one that actually, you know, has feel, uh, felt the strain more harder than the rest of the populations. Also, these two groups have seen uh, an increase in their spending as well. If you look at the uh, expenditure growth to their income growth ratio, we are talking about multiples of about 5.6 times. So in other words, their expenses has actually went up a lot as well compared to their growth in uh, their income. And finally, um, these two groups also have uh, you know, a narrower uh, bandwidth when it comes to their ability to stomach higher inflation. Um, because at the end of the day, they spend more than 90% of their income. So if not for some of the government uh, support measures, um, I think they will basically um, be going through a tough times if inflation continues to stay high. Irvin, is there any way then that they can sort of overcome this issue? Well, um, I think the strong sing dollar uh, definitely will help because the MAS has tightened monetary policy uh, four times since October last year. Now, having a strong sing dollar is important because it will help to keep imported inflation at bay because ultimately about 60 to 70% of our domestic consumption are actually imported. So if you are able to keep, have, uh, I mean, if you are able to maintain a strong currency, that obviously will ensure that, you know, the cost of our, the imports that is meant for consumption can be kept low. Um, the government has also rolled out a 1.5 billion support package. I think that will go in some way in terms of helping, you know, the vulnerable segments of society cope 
with this high uh, inflationary pressure. But having said that, having all this policy support definitely will be useful, but it all boils down to individuals' responsibility. I think it is important for individuals you know, to keep track of their budgets, uh, to ensure that you know, they live within their means, and ultimately to exercise sustainable financial planning in order to put them in, into a better position to tight through this uh, period of high inflation. That's really good advice. But you know, now we come to the big question. Where is inflation heading next year and how long is it expected to last? How crucial is it that we make these changes now? Yes, I think we really have to do what we can now, right? If required, we may have to tighten our belts, right? We need to be more prudent uh, in our spending. Essentially, we need to live within our means because high inflation is here to stay. And in fact, in my opinion, even though on the short term cyclical basis, we will, I mean, uh, our expectation is that inflation is near its peak, all right? It will peak sometime around the third quarter of this year, which is more or less now but it will moderate uh, towards the end of the year and going to 2023. But having said that, that despite that moderation, headline inflation will still average about 4% in 2023 next year. Now, how high is 4%? Now, to provide some context, the 30 years historical average inflation in Singapore is just barely about 2%. So even if there is some moderations to 4%, next year, it is still twice the historical average. So the point I'm trying to make is that high inflation is here to stay. And in my opinion, such high inflation number will probably last for about two to three years. So I don't think we should pin our hope for inflation to come down. I think we should do what we can and to ensure that we put ourselves in a better financial uh, state so that we can weather through this period of high inflation. Ultimately, it is up to individuals' responsibility if you want to win the race against inflation. Sounds like it's really time for us to rethink our finances. Many thanks for your insights, Irvin Sia, Senior Economist at DBS. And those are our top stories today. Visit straightstimes.com for more news and our YouTube channel for more videos. Subscribe by hitting the red button below. I'm Chao Suan and see you tomorrow on The Big Story.